Yes. <laughs> so, um, Harvard Catalyst is the name of Harvard's Clinical and Translational Science Institute, similar to New Cats here at um, Northwestern. And one of the goals of CTSA is to bring teams together and sort of break down silos in biomedicine. Harvard has 33 affiliated uh, hospitals and academic healthcare centers. And there's a real challenge of one investigator trying to find another investigator across that complex landscape. So the first informatics program we built as a part of our CTSA was this program called Social, uh, it's a social networking application called Harvard Catalyst Profiles. Uh, we started by pulling in uh, data from our human resources database of about 20,000 Harvard faculty, and we created profiles for them. There's, before I kind of jump into the application, I want to discuss sort of the model here. Um, you're familiar with networks. There are kind of nodes and connections in there. And I have this idea of profiles, networks, and connections inside of the profile site. Here I show a co-authorship network. John is highlighted. And uh, he has some co-authors. Charles, Ken, Zach, Tom, Mary, Jeff. Most of the programs in this domain focus on the nodes. You create a page for John. You create a page for Charles. And you click from one page to the other. And we call those profile pages. Because there's all sorts of information you might want to learn about John. What's his contact information? What are his publications? What kind of courses does he teach? That's not the only thing that's interesting about this picture. There's a network. A network is a group of people that have something in common. This group of people is highlighted. What they have in common is they've all worked with John in the past. But there's a lot of other things you may want to ask about this network. You know, when did these people join the network? Who's the first one? Who's the most recent one? What topics are they studying in this research collaboration. So, there's a lot of, so we actually create a whole profile of this network inside of profiles. Then you can drill down to a single connection. So John co-authored with Charles, but how many publications did they write together? What are the publications? What topics are these publications? So we create a whole page just about this one connection. So in profiles, we go back and forth between these profiles, networks, and connections. And the entire website is divided into that. Every single page is either a profile page, a network page, or a connection page. And I'll show you examples of what that looks like. So this is a profile page. We got John's basic contact information from our human resources directory. We have an automatic PubMed disambiguation engine, we call it, which pulls in the right publications for him. Faculty can go in and add photographs and put in a research narrative of awards. But this part of the center here is really your standard faculty profiling system, and every school has something like this, to really kind of demonstrate connections. Because if I just look for John, I type in John Alamka, search for him, pull up his profile, it's me and him, and what you're, not, what you're missing is the 20,000 other people at Harvard that we're connected to. So I really wanted to highlight how the person that you're looking at is not just an isolated person. They're part of a team, part of a community, and it's much bigger than what you might think. So we added this concept of active and passive networks. Passive networks are on the right, and these are all the networks that John is part of that we're able to determine automatically by mining the content in his profile. Um, networks on the left are active networks because these are networks users generate themselves as they go through the website and indicate that John's my collaborator, John's an advisor. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about these passive networks. Um, the data in the actual profile is real data. These are his publications. These are his research narratives. These passive networks are things you derive, and they can be sort of probabilistic that you know, these are people we think are John's similar people. John didn't come in and say, this is my similar person. We have an algorithm that does that. So the first uh, passive network I want to talk about are these concepts over here. So John has a number of publications. The publications have keywords, and we have an algorithm that ranks those, public, those keywords and says these are the top things that, five things that John does. John's a chief information officer. And naturally, some of the concepts are things like medical record systems, computer security, and so on. We leave this profile page, and we can drill down into the network. So this is a network of all the concepts where what their relation is is that there are things that John Alamka has studied. Um, every network inside of profiles has many different ways of visualizing it, depending on what you want to learn about the network. This is a concept cloud visualization. So the bigger the terms, the more important it is to his research, the smaller grayed out terms are less important. This is not just based on number of publications. So for example, John has written a lot of papers about adult patients. But everyone else at Harvard Medical School has written about adult patients. 
So you wouldn't be reaching out to John because of his expertise in that. So the things that are big and bold are stuff that he's written a lot about. He's also we look at um, how many years ago the articles were. You know, something he wrote about 20 years ago, he may not be the expert anymore. Uh, we look if he was the first author or the middle author. A lot of different factors come in here as well as uniqueness. Is this a term that everyone is studying or is this something unique to John? So these things that are big and bold are reasons why you would want to contact John for a collaboration. Because he's unique and he has a lot of expertise in medical record linkage and computer, computer communication networks and the other bold things. And that's maybe why you would want to pull him into a group. This is the exact same network, but now grouped into semantic categories. So all the different living beings he works with or different objects or methods he works with. It's the same data, but it's highlighting a different attribute of that network. Any network that has temporal information can be drawn on a timeline. So John's research has changed over time. In the late 1990s, he was looking at the internet and confidentiality. More recently, he's looking at medical records and regional health planning. So you can see how his fields of interest have changed over the course of his career. Every network has one of these detailed pages where we list every item that we put into the network. Some basic information. So here's the number of publications, the most recent year. And there's a connection weight. This is sort of the probability that we think that John is truly an expert in this particular area. And this last column is something I got from the Sonic Lab here, the little Y link. So you know, once you go and say that we think that John is an expert in computer security with a strength of uh, 2.704, you know, everyone's going to go, no, why? So you click that Y link, and the Y links take you to connection pages. So here we show John Alonk on one side, Computer Secure on the other side. They're connected through 11 publications in common. So John's written 11 publications about computer security. They're listed here. Each publication has a score to it. You can click that score and see how that gets derived based on a combination of um, how old it is, what the topics were, and so on. That gets summed up and it gives you the overall connection strength. We started at John's profile, went to his network of concepts, and then we drilled into a connection of how John is related to one specific concept. Another kind of network are his co-authors. So here's a list view of the list of people at Harvard that he's worked with in the past. Any network of geographic information, like an office address, can be geocoded and mapped to latitude and longitude and drawn on a Google map. So this is where his co-authors are in the Boston area. This is an egocentric uh, radial graph. So John is in the center, his co-authors are in the first ring, and the co-authors of his co-authors are in the outer ring. Here's the same network in a force directed graph. So in this one, you start seeing some of the teams he worked with. There's a group around here, around David Bates. There's another group in this corner, which are faculty from Beth Israel Hospital. And then here's Zach Ahane's, um group that John has worked with. You can see the connections between all those different teams. Here are similar people. So we look at all of John's keywords, and we compare them to all the keywords that everyone else has at Harvard. We say these are the 60 people whose research is most similar to John's. The ones with stars are people that he's worked with before. Most of the people don't have stars. This Harvard is so big that you can't work with everybody in your field. Um, we originally created this list to help people like John find new collaborators. But users have found many other applications for this kind of a list. The day we went live, it completely changed how faculty affairs forms promotion committees. You have to find a group of people who are similar to the person up for promotion, but never worked with them before. And it used to take them two weeks of manually going through paper CVs in order to find the members of this group. Now, when someone's up for promotion, they just type their name in, and the first five people on the list are the promotion committee. This is good for inviting speakers for like conferences and seminars. I was asked to give a talk in Japan, and I couldn't go. And they said, do you know anyone else at Harvard like you who can maybe speak on your behalf? And I said, here are 60 people. Um, students use this to find mentors. If you hear a good speaker in your class one day, you can find everyone else at the university that's researching that same kind of topics. One of the most common uses for this is what we call ego surfing, where people like to look themselves up, not for collaborators, but who their potential competitors are. Most people know like the first four or five on the list. Once you get down to six or seven, again, Harvard's so big, they always run into someone they never heard of before. They click and look at their publication list, and it's, oh my goodness, they're publishing in Cell and Science. And, and the knee-jerk reaction is, these are competitors. But kind of ask, once they get over that, um, they see maybe these are people they should learn more about and you know, potentially collaborate with ultimately. Another kind of passive network or same department. Some of our departments, like the Department of Medicine, may have 1,000 people in it. 
This is a random reminder of some of your organizational colleagues. And there's physical neighbors. A lot of the offices are not in the prime downtown hospital real estate. They're out in these mixed office buildings where one hospital rents out one floor and another hospital rents out a different floor. So John's at Beth Israel Hospital. The closest faculty member to him is from Children's Hospital. They're on different floors. They may not even know each other, but they're one flight down. And um, uh, research has shown that people who are physically close to each other have more, more highly cited products and work well together. And you may not even realize that a uh, person who would be a really good collaborator is right next door because we have these organizational boundaries that um, uh, keep people separate, even though they may be very physical. These are multi-dimensional networks, not just people. It's people connected to publications and mesh terms and journals and organizations. So you can take any node in the network and generate a profile around it. So no one typed in information about computer security. But we know some security, computer security information related to John and all of the other colleagues. So we can assemble all that and create a profile for computer security. And just as people in the upper right corner had their top concepts, a concept has top people. Just as you can use the networks to find which people are similar, you can see what concepts are similar. Just as a person has publications, a concept has publications and timelines and citation counts and so on. So all the kind of things you can do in one network, one network type or node type, um, with passive networks, you can do for all these other kinds of node types. This is what the, the public profiles website does. And this is what faculty um, uh, use on a daily basis at Harvard Medical School. This is an open source program. It's used at a lot of other institutions. Behind the scenes, we have all this network information about people. Some of it actual data, some of it derived that we're making guesses, and there's some probability to it. Um, but you can apply standard social network analysis uh, metrics to all these different kinds of networks and learn a lot of things about how people collaborate, uh, how to design interventions to um, help people form new connections. So I'm going to go through some of the kinds of experiments we do using the data in the networks. Okay. So um, one of the network metrics we look at is reach. So this is co-authorship reach, meaning the number of co-authors a person has plus the number of co-authors their co-authors have. And we see that at Harvard, a brand new research assistant has about 45 people in their network, a full professor 450 people. So you go up an order of magnitude in the size of your um, networks uh, through the course of your career. There's a lot of variation. The pathologist, everyone who's doing a tissue, has a tissue specimen on their study is collaborating with the pathologist. So the pathologists work with a lot of people. Um, specialties like ophthalmology, dental medicine, neurobiology, these collaborations are much smaller. Whereas by discipline, the statisticians are working at 5% effort on 20 different grants. So they have huge networks of collaborations. Um, physiology, uh, microbiology, these are much smaller networks. Interestingly, the people who study people, anthropologists, have the fewest collaborators. <laughs> I spoke to an anthropologist once who said, uh, that this is something they know about in their field, that uh, most of their work is kind of isolated and they don't have a lot of big team. <laughs> Here I'm looking at closeness versus betweenness. So but closeness is the average number of co-authorship hops you are from another person. So just like Kevin Bacon degrees of separation among actors and actresses, any two Harvard faculty are connected to some number of co-authorship hops. On average, it's like 3.8, and there's a range. Betweenness is if Person A and person B, the shortest path connecting them goes through me. It increases my between the score. So what's interesting here are outliers. So number one are people that are very distant from the bulk of Harvard Medical School community, but they have very high between us. Most of these people are psychiatrists in McLean Hospital. It's a geographically isolated institution. It's a specialty place. But every once in a while, these people are pulled into different clinical trials at different hospitals. So they may be the only bridge connecting two parts of the university, even though most of the time they're collaborating among themselves. Number two, these are people that are um, very close, uh, are very well connected to the rest of the Harvard faculty, um, but they're very low between the scores. Most of these are junior faculty and postdocs in the lab of someone famous. So it's through their mentor that they got really well connected. They themselves aren't the key to the collaboration. And then number three, um, the people that are very high, good closeness and high between the scores, these are almost all statisticians and informatics people who 
work very interdisciplinary and kind of have computational methods that help out lots of different people in different fields. Um, social grams are often used in social network analysis to draw the pictures of the collaborations. Uh, we have 20,000 people at our CTSA, and you, you try to draw a graph of this, you get one of those hairball diagrams. So we have to figure out kind of a novel way of being able to display um, large social networks in the context over here. So uh, these we call these org plots, where there are 20,000 little dots on this graph, one for every faculty member at Harvard. Horizontal bands group people at the same institution. These are all the Mass General Hospital people, these are all the Brigham Women's Hospital people. Vertical bars great departments and divisions, it's alphabetical, anesthesia is on the left and surgery is on the right. This green dot here is me. I'm in the IT department at Harvard Medical School. The red dots are my co-authors, the blue dots are the co-authors of my co-authors. So this is a picture of my reach overlaid on an organizational map of Harvard Medical School. And what you can see here is I'm typical of medical, biomedical informatics researchers and statisticians in that I have collaborators all over the university. I know people in a lot of different um, types of departments and different schools at Harvard. Uh, I do have some clusters. I've done a lot of work um, at, uh, in pathology at Mass General and the Brigham and at Dana-Farber. I do have some gaps, some holes where I haven't really worked for departments. This is my closeness heat map. So the red departments are the ones where I'm closest to in terms of co-authorship hops, and the blue departments are the ones I'm furthest away from. I showed you before that full professors have a very large reach. And I'm an assistant professor. I hope to uh, increase my reach and become a full professor someday. So how do I know how to increase my network size? Profiles can make recommendations. So it can say that if I write a paper with David Zirkowski, I'll add 205 blue dots to my reach graph. And it's kind of a weird way to think about searching for people, but I'm getting this mentoring advice all the time. Everyone says, write papers, apply for grants, teach more often, give more talks. No one has ever said to me, you should build a large team or find collaborators. And I think the reason is because no one has ever had a way of kind of measuring what my reach is or making recommendations on how to improve my reach. Um, so it's kind of a, a very different kind of way of looking for a collaborator, not someone who um, can give you money or write a publication, but can extend your uh, network of collaborators. You can learn some different things, different patterns in these kind of graphs. So here's what I call a generalist versus a specialist. So both of these people have the exact same reach, essentially, like 542 people. The number of publications is very different, and the picture looks different. I'm here, uh, I'm a generalist, I work with a lot of different people, and you can see how my red dots are scattered all over the place. This is an individual who's an endocrinologist and studies a particular molecule um, uh, in endocrinology. And all of his colleagues are endocrinologists, either at his own institution or in endocrinology divisions and other institutions. So even though he's got 10 times more publications as me, most of those publications are with the same group of people. Most of my publications are all with different teams. So is, and one pattern isn't better than another. There are different career paths and how people do research and uh, um, uh, what kind of work that they do. Here we look at career progression. We have a grant. Look at diversity in the work. Why women underrepresented minorities aren't getting promoted as quickly as um, their male counterparts at the um, institution. And we're looking at this idea of collaboration and does your networks have an impact on um, how your career advances. So we have three pictures. There's a 33-year-old male assistant professor with tall publications, a 46-year-old female still on instructor level with the same number of publications, and a highly successful uh, full professor dean with 213 publications. And when you look at publication counts, the middle picture and the one on the left have the same number of publications, but their pictures look very different. The one on the left here, the 46-year-old female instructor, all of her colleagues are in the same division. Every one of her publications is with the same group of people, and uh, they have very few kind of colleagues outside of that group. This picture over here is a much more diverse group. And when you look at the person at the end of a very you know, successful career, though he doesn't call it the end, he calls it <laughs> his prime, um, you can see how he has colleagues everywhere. He's 
he either knows everybody or knows someone who can introduce him to that person. And this is kind of where you want to be. And we see these people, they kind of stalled at this graph. And they may be still getting publications out, but their picture never makes it towards um, this one on the right. You can combine social network analysis and a keyword search. So here are the asthma researchers at Harvard Medical School. The bigger the circle, the more research they've done. The red circles are people who have big network reach. The blue and circle, blue and purple circles are the ones with smaller number of collaborators. So if you're looking for a top asthma researcher, collaborate with our big red circle instead of the big blue circle. At the end of that asthma study, you'll now be part of a much bigger network than if you had worked with that blue person. However, the big red circles, those are very busy people and don't have time really for new colleagues. So you may actually want to go to a big blue circle and say, hey, if we work together, we can increase both of our reach and get a publication out of this collaboration. So there's some idea of uh, motivation and what you're looking for uh, in one of these kind of graphs and whether you want a big network or a small network, if you want someone in your own discipline or local institution or someone across institutional boundaries. What these org plots do is they just allow you to view complicated network information on multiple dimensions in a way that's easier to understand. Next thing I'll talk about is personalized search. So uh, this again, this is not a tool that's currently available to faculty, but it's something we use internally for different experiments. So let's say I'm a student and I'm looking for a mentor and I'm interested in computational biology. So I can type in computational biology and they'll tell me there are 210 matches. It'll give me some options of narrowing down my search. So here it's breaking down and says, uh, you know, do you, are you looking for a computational biologist who also do software or other kind of things? So protein array analysis, that sounds interesting. So when I do a computational biology and protein array analysis, now I'm down to a list of 18 people and that sounds more reasonable. So now I click, let me see those 18 people and it ranks the 18 but it gives me a bunch of other information. Um, some of these people are at the same institution as I am, some are at different institutions. Some are junior faculty, some are senior faculty, and that may be important to me in which one I select. Some of these people are co-authors of mine. So Todd Gallo, I've written a paper with him in the past. He's further down on the list, but it may be easier for me to contact him because I worked with him before. Uh, everyone I said is some number of co-authorship hops away at Harvard. So the first person on the list is three hops away. I really don't know how to connect to him. The second one on the list, Martha Bullock, I know we both co-authored with the person George Church at Harvard Medical School. So it may be easier for me to get to the number two person on the list than number one. Mesh similarity. So the first person on the list, the more similar to than the second or third, that may be important. Physical distance. First person on the list is two miles away from my office, and the second person is less than a tenth of a mile away. So that might be important to me as well. This next column reach, this is um, the reach of this individual person. This last column is the amount of reach I would gain if I collaborated with that individual. So these are all kind of individual metrics that um, combined in some magic way would ultimately help me decide which person I want to you know, work with. Now if I go and pick the right person, now how do you actually go and contact them? Now there was a 13th Nobel laureate over medical school a year or so ago. If I go and send him a random email and he's never heard about me before, well, that's not the way to form evaluation. Normally, it's I know someone who knows someone else, and that kind of gets me introduced. So here, I can type in two names, so Griffin Weber and John Alonka, and it'll show me the shortest path connecting us. In this case, uh, it's four hops. I've written with Lucille, who's written with Zach, who's written with Ken, who's written with John Alonka. And if that path doesn't get me to him, there's a number of alternatives, ways through the networks that I can ultimately connect up. Finding an individual person is relatively easy compared to building a whole team. There's sort of two complex parts about building a team. Um, one of them is, is computational. We have 20,000 people at Harvard. If you wanted to pick a team of four people, there are 10 to the 15th number of different four-person teams you can select from. So you have to go think about all these different possible teams. You need to find a group of people of complementary expertise. So you know, if you type in the topic of the proposal, the RFA that you want to apply for, you know, there's not going to be any one individual who's an expert in everything that the grant is requiring. So you're looking for people who are not experts, but somewhere lower down, but somehow 
these groups of people all combined will have the expertise that you need to do the project. Then there's also the social science part of it. You can't just put four people together and hope that they'll become successful. There's different motivations why people want to come together and collaborate. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's both this computational challenge and there's also a social challenge of trying to figure out a group of people with complementary skills who are likely to come together and work well together. So we have some tools to help do this. So in this program, you can enter in a hypothesis or the text to an RFA or a description of what you want to do. You hit search and it'll extract the concepts out of it and then tell you for the individual concepts the top people in that area. So this paragraph I typed in requires expertise in gene expression, retina, neuroglia, and stem cells. And individually, these are the top people in that area at Harvard. So now I can sort of pick one person from each list and form a team. So there's a lot of different choices I can do if I'm picking one from each list. So how do I you know, compare them? So here I can pick one particular team. So group of people I like to work with, John Alamco, Lucio Mercado, Zakahani, myself, and Connie Sepko. Uh, and there's different ways you can look at this group. Some of us have co-authored together before. Most of us haven't. Everyone is some number of hops away from each other in co-authorship network. There's physical distance. So most of us are about a quarter of a mile away from each other. John's a little over a mile away, so I don't know if John's going to be happy with having to you know, walk a mile each time we're going to get together. Then there's mesh similarity. Say I don't have enough funds for five people on my grant. I can see that Lucilla and Zach have very highly similar research. I can see which one would add more blue dots to my reach graph and kick the other one off the project. And these seem like very kind of harsh ways of judging a team, but it's what we do in our heads anyway when we're trying to find collaborators. This is really just assigning numbers to that process. Then the hard part is really now, okay, I have a bunch of things over here. How do I combine that into a single number and then look at the 10 to the 15th possibilities and find a team that has the highest number? So how do you like figure out that magic optimization function uh, to give a score to a team? So what you can do, and we've done this at Harvard and you've done this here at Northwestern, is look at teams that have applied for funding and have been successful and got funding and see what, how do they look compared to other people and what are the factors that are influential in, um, uh, uh, in a team being successful. So here I looked at uh, Harvard's CTSA pilot grants. Every CTSA has these. New Cats had some pilot awards. We did this in each year. Here I'm just showing 2009 data, which is in 2009 and 2010. Um, Harvard CTSA is the largest CTSA. We have a large number of pilot grants. Um, there are, in 2009, 279 applications. This represents about 1,500 people. Um, so we have a, actually quite a bit of data here. And we came up with several cohorts. In this table, I have people that actually submitted proposals, the ones that were awarded funding. This is random faculty reporting from all of, so out of the pool of 20,000. And we'll randomly select putting into these virtual teams such that the size, the distribution of the size of these teams matches the actual proposals. So if there was a five-person proposal that was submitted in 2009, we created a random five-person team. This next column here is all matched on faculty rank. So if there was a five-person team where there were two full professors and three assistant professors, in the in cohort, we have the same thing, a five-person team with a random two full professors and a random three assistant professors. And in this third group are the 1,500 for funding, shuffling them around so that we're kind of randomly grouping that same group of people into teams. So have these five things over here, completely random teams matched on size, random teams matched on size and faculty rank, the actual cohort of people who applied for funding but scrambling the um, applications, the ones that were submitted, and then the ones that are actually funded. Um, and then we can look at different metrics here. And we have 50 or so things that we looked at. I'm pulling out a few that uh, at least I thought were interesting. So if you have a random team, about 5% of them are full professors. But 15% of the applicants were full professors, and 23% of the ones that were funded were full professors. If you look at MDPHDs, uh, having the ones that funding had more MD-PhDs on them, the ones that awarded funding had you know, more MD-PhDs on it. If you look at the number of publications, 
So even when you control for academic rank, the people who applied for funding had more publications than the people who didn't apply for funding. These numbers are slightly different because these are averages per um, application. So we take each one of the 279 applications, we see what's the average number of publications on that application, and then we average all the applications. Some people are um, on multiple applications, so when you're scrambling things around a bit, the numbers are slightly different between this column and this column. But the main point is this big jump in the people with more publications are applying, and even more publications are the ones that got funded. We look at the reach as a similar kind of thing, where um, people with a bigger reach uh, are more likely to apply for funding and get funding. Now, the pilot grants, there's a very specific um, RFA. It's not disease or topic specific. Anybody can apply for this. The instructions, though, were they wanted people to form new teams, preferably between junior and senior faculty in different institutions across Harvard. So, you know, you may think that uh, people who are good at forming collaborations, like these people with big reach, may also be the ones who are able to pull a group together to apply for them. What I found is really interesting here is when you look at age. So when you adjust for faculty rank, even though these people have a lot more publications, much bigger uh, collaboration networks, on average, the people who applied for funding were five years younger than other people at the same academic rank. So these are people who are young for their academic rank, but they've already exceeded sort of the average for their faculty rank in terms of publication counts and size of their networks. These are individual metrics. These things here are pairwise. So if you have a team of four people, there are six pairs of people in that team. So if you randomly pull teams together at Harvard, we have 33 institutions, some are bigger than others. On average, 14% of the pairs on a team are from the same institution. Remember, we told people to find partners at other institutions. And even though we told them that, 46% of the pairs end up being from the same institution. And uh, when they actually came down to who won the awards, it goes back in the opposite direction, where 29% you know, are the ones that actually got funded. Same kind of thing with co-authors. It's actually very unlikely that two random people are co-authors. But 19% of the pairs were co-authors uh, who applied and about the same number that got funded. Co-citations we also looked at. Mesh similarity. The more similar you are to people, um, the more likely it was you applied or uh, got funding. Physical distance. Two random people at Harvard Medical School are 14 miles apart. The ones who applied for funding are 1.6 miles apart. And the ones that got funded were 0.9 miles apart. So close proximity does uh, help with this. These two metrics down here are looking globally. So the 1,500 people that applied, we looked at them as one network, 1,500 people, and we looked at the co-authorship network. And what's the density of that network? So um, uh, the people who applied for funding, that network is much denser than a random 1,500 people at Harvard. And the group that got funded are even more dense. So the, the whole point of these CTSA pilot grants are to bring people together who haven't worked together and form new collaborations. But what we're seeing here is that people, even though they may be pulling in other people, their groups are primarily consisting of people from the same institution, former collaborators, and the sort of pool of people who ended up getting funded, they're very well connected. Not only among themselves, but these are the teams. The teams themselves have co-authorship connections between them. So within a single team, there are a lot of co-authors. But between teams as well, there's a lot of co-authors. There's sort of like group of people who are the young go-getters, who are uh, getting publications, getting collaborators, and also going after these little tiny pilot grants, even though it's a small amount of money and they could be applying for much bigger things. And they're also very well connected, not only to other people in their group, but this group as a whole. These 1,500 people are much more highly connected than the uh, 18,000 who didn't apply. So you can use this information as sort of coefficients in these optimization functions to help you build recommendation engines um, uh, to uh, you know, start with this information where you're getting the list of people who have the expertise, looking at the different groups, combining these numbers, and figuring out which team to, to use. And we did this at the, actually actively at Harvard. We had this uh, CTSA pilot grant, uh, some additional supplement money to do a project in type 1 diabetes. So there's a type 1 diabetes RFA. 
and normally the same type 1 diabetes experts apply for funding all the time. So what we did was we used this tool to identify groups of two to four people that we thought would be able to apply for this funding and do something very unique with it. We sent out the emails to 200 groups and we suggested they apply for funding. These are people who may have never worked in type 1 diabetes before or worked with each other before. We got a lot of emails back saying, what in the world are you talking about? I don't know anything about type 1 diabetes. And, and some of them actually did apply for funding. They didn't necessarily apply for funding in the groups that we recommended. They kind of broke up and formed other kind of groups. And we're trying to, we have another grant now where we're analyzing that data to try to figure out what the effect was of actually emailing these teams of people and suggesting it. Is it just getting an email about an RFA makes it more likely that you are applying for the RFA? Or did the recommendations that we uh, gave them have any impact? Um, another kind of thing related to this type 1 diabetes grant is how you form review committees. Um, another aspect of this project was we did a crowdsourcing experiment. The idea was um, this same kind of type 1 diabetes research is being done all the time. And the field hasn't advanced that much in the last few decades. So we opened it up to the public. We, we posted this thing. We partnered with a company called Innocentive.com. And we asked the world, if you have any ideas related to type 1 diabetes, you don't have to figure out how to solve it. You just have a question. You can submit that for a contest and there's a prize in the end. So we got um, a couple hundred uh, submissions from all sorts of people, patients, parents of patients, researchers in medicine, researchers in engineering and uh, cell biology. We have human resources staff at Harvard Medical School that apply. You know, people from many different backgrounds and different takes on type 1 diabetes submitted hypotheses. And the problem is, who's going to review these? You know, Normally, a review group consists of the type 1 diabetes experts. You pull the experts together, and they're used to seeing proposals written by experts. They're not used to seeing proposals written by people outside of their own field. So we had a problem. We wanted to figure out how we can fairly review these very novel ideas. So we use the social networks to form six different groups. One group are the type 1 diabetes experts. So these are the people who actually have written about type 1 diabetes before. Another group are what we call related expertise. So we looked at people who are co-authors of the type 1 diabetes experts, but they themselves have not written about type 1 diabetes. Um, then we looked at people with no type 1 diabetes expertise. So these are people who've never written about type 1 diabetes, they've never worked with anybody who's done type 1 diabetes, and they're not an endocrinologist or an immunologist. So these are people we thought were as far away from type 1 diabetes as possible. And then we have one team of senior faculty and one team of junior faculty. So we get six overall. So the first thing we want to know is, did this computational way of trying to get at expertise, or is it valid? So we asked the reviewers in these different groups, each group had about 30 reviewers, um, to rank how much research they do in related to diabetes. And the people we thought were type 1 diabetes experts uh, ranked themselves high, the ones that we thought were related but in the middle, and the ones we thought had no expertise said they had no expertise. And the senior faculty said they did more research than the junior faculty. So using some of this network with properties, we are able to pull out people who self-report the amount of expertise that we thought they were going to have. And the reviews we got are kind of what we expected. The type 1 diabetes experts gave the lowest average impact scores to these crowdsourced ideas, and sort of the less expertise you had, the higher um, you rated these different types of ideas. And in the end, we kind of averaged these six different review groups to uh, come up with the final score. And the winners had some really interesting ideas, and they came from all over the place. There was an undergraduate at Harvard that won one of the awards, engineers, like people who were really outside of the field who had some really terrific ideas where, you know, the type 1 diabetes people see this stuff, and it's very valid things. And now for that, um, other project where we had the RFA to uh, identify teams to go and solve these problems. We now have actual research teams funded with $200,000 grants. They're now testing these hypotheses that were uh, submitted by crowdsourcing mechanisms and reviewed by these kind of novel review groups. Here goes individually as well. So each dot here represents a different reviewer. The more high every as you kind of go through this, the higher their type 1 diabetes expertise, the lower they ranked on average um, these proposals. 
I mentioned before about we have this diversity in the workforce grant where we're looking at why women in underrepresented minorities aren't getting promoted at the same rates as um, kind of the historical white male faculty. So just kind of show you what the problem is. Our medical school, you know, at the instructor level, there's an equivalent number of men and women. And as you go higher and higher up the ranks, you see the this less and less women in that in the populations. So Where at the full professor level, it's actually pretty rare that there's a, a female professor. We see similar kind of things with race. How at the lower ranks, it's um, more even distribution, and as you get higher and higher up the ranks, uh, we start seeing the differences. One of the things we notice, and this is um, this is uh, the big part of the grant proposal, saying, you know, people know this stuff. We've been talking about stories about this uh, for many decades, but no one has really done anything on a computation. Here, what we saw was that when you look at men and women, they start out the same, and up to age 35 or so, they have similar networks. And then, as they get older, you start seeing this divergence, and that men have bigger network reach than um, women, and you may just think this is uh, women are taking time off to raise families, but you see the same kind of thing with race and ethnicity as well, that um, underrepresented minorities, probably Asians and white, there's differences in the size of their networks. So it seems like up to age 35 or so, everyone's equivalent. Now, it doesn't, we don't know if it's that starting 15 years ago, things changed, and now these people who are 35 and all the same are going to remain the same, or if there's something that happens um, later on in people's careers that cause this diversion. These are the kind of the initial findings we had that led to the study. And um, we've been doing initial analysis since we received the award. How are some nice databases? One of the databases we have is uh, promotion databases going back several decades. So we can look at what happens to people's careers um, over long periods of time. So the kind of entry level faculty rank at Harvard's instructor um, and this shows this basically three things that can happen. You either stay as an instructor, you get promoted, or you leave Harvard. But 50% of them end up leaving Harvard um, before ever getting promoted. There's a group of instructors who are basically the clinicians at the hospitals who stay at instructor level for their entire career. They're not really researchers, they're just treating patients and they get that kind of nominal instructor position. Once people get promoted to assistant professor, between like five and seven years, they either get promoted or they leave, and very few remain at assistant. A lot of people stay at associate professor level for their whole career at Harvard Medical School. And then uh, once they're a full professor, um, they stay for basically the rest of their career, with just a few of them leaving over time. There's variations, though. Um, females spend a lot more time at the instructor level than males, um, and then that decreases as you go up the ranks. Um, you see similar kinds of things uh, with race, but not as big as you see with the, the gender differences. Um, even though we saw that uh, at a given age, women have smaller networks than men, and it takes them longer to get promoted to the same academic rank, once you're at a certain academic rank, the network sizes differences then go away. So a full professor, male or woman, they both have an equally large network. It just seems to take a lot longer for the women to build up that big a network. It's slightly different with um, race and ethnicities, the underrepresented minorities. They're able to become a full professor or reach these different ranks with smaller networks. And we're not really sure um, why this is yet. This is part of what this um, study is all about. But one hypothesis you can think of like homophily. We look at our pilot grants and we see that when the male is a PI, it's more likely the co-investigator is a male female to PI, more likely the female, and same thing with race and ethnicity. So the kind of idea is that if you're part of a minority group and you like to work with people like yourselves, you're sort of self-limiting your reach in that you're only working in a small group and you're not branching out to the bigger pool. If you're in the big pool to begin with and you're trying to stay within that pool, you have a lot more options and that may be one of the reasons why it takes longer for the people who are starting out in a small pool to collaborate you know, with a, a, a bigger group. This is another thing that, uh, you know, we have some evidence for it yet, but there's a lot of work we still have to do on that. I'll, um, end by just mentioning how really the next big thing is we're doing all this stuff locally, but the software is used in many different places. The profiles um, software we have at Harvard 
Uh, we have a user group community of like 140 different places around the country. Um, people have done some interesting things customizing their website and using it. UCSF has done some really interesting experiments about how to get people to use these tools and sort of contests that will encourage them to fill in their profiles and add publications and things to it. Uh, we recently did a project called Direct Experts where we got 30 institutions from around the country to agree to develop an API and share their information. So instead of networks within one institution, this is building a national network. It has both profiles as well as seven other products, including um, an NIH funded program called Vivo, Elsevier's commercial SciVal experts, a lot of homegrown tools. And it's a simple tool where you type in a keyword, it broadcasts out the search to all these different institutions and returns back the aggregate counts of the number of people at each institution that match a query. You click on that institution name and you go off to that institution's website where you view the list of matching people. It's a very simple application, but it was very important in that it got 30 institutions to agree to collaborate on a tool like this. When we approached them two years ago, there was a lot of reluctance. No one wanted to share information. And we went back, this is in October 2011 and 10, and sort of the environment changed. We got a few institutions to agree to work together on this. And once there was like 10 or so sites, it became, I don't want to be left out of the network. So all of a sudden, hot, uh, hospitals and CTSAs that didn't want to share the before all of a sudden felt like they were going to be left out of something if they didn't participate. So it, it took us like a year to get 10 sites up here, and then it was like two weeks to get the next 20. It had this sort of exponential growth. And you see these with social networking sites and stuff. You've got to get it to a critical number, and then the whole environment changes. So now that we have every institution willing to um, share data, and there was a recommendation that got approved by the CTS APIs, the CTS APIs approved that um, all the CTSAs will um, encourage their senior leadership at their institutions to adopt one of these um, uh, open data available research networking tools to build these national networks. Um, going from aggregate accounts to more complex kind of connections uh, requires more complicated technology. We use something called Semantic Web based on uh, a linked open data ontology developed by Vivo program. This is just what linked open data looks like. And what I'll just end with is you know, biomedical research isn't isolated. It collaborates with a lot of other people. I'm here today talking to communication people. Or, uh, so when you're talking about national expertise networks, it can't just be isolated to biomedicine. You've got to branch out and build connections with other kind of disciplines. And then it gets into complications of how do you find expertise in these other places when you don't have things like PubMed. So at Harvard, we are expanding our profiles to the whole university and we're comparing what do you get from PubMed? What do you get from a purchase of Web of Knowledge? And what, uh, what kind of faculty does publications really not, is much less relevant? So you see a nice progression. Things like cell biology and uh, molecular cell bio. A lot of these faculty have PubMed articles. Then in the social sciences, it's much more you have to go to Web of Knowledge. Then you get into things like the music department, romance languages. Even um, Web of Knowledge isn't going to help you get uh, the scholarly output of these people. I spoke to a dean of uh, arts at one of the Boston colleges. I said, but what do your faculty do? I know what a biomedical researcher does. We publish and we get grants. What do your faculty do? And he said, performances. And there's a lot of ways you can think of a performance. Uh, uh, a music professor might have a concert. An artist might have a gallery exhibit. An architect might have a blueprint for a building. And Whereas citations are important in biomedical publications, like how many times has someone read and cited your article, the equivalent in some of these other disciplines is the audience of your presentation. So did you have the concert for just faculty here at Northwestern, or was this a nationally televised um, uh, July 4th concert kind of thing? So you know, when you look at other disciplines, you've got to think about you know, what is the network, what is the measure of impact, and uh, map those so you can build these um, uh, cross-disciplinary networks. Because what you think of it as an important network and um, the data item in one kind of discipline is very different than what faculty do in something else. Another example is our School of Education at Harvard. Um, what's very important to them is consultations with K-12 through school districts. And they want to know which two faculty have consulted on the same school district consulted on two school districts that are geographically close to each other, 
two school districts with the same socioeconomic background. So their uh, consultational K through 12 school district networks look very similar to biomedical research co-authorship networks. It's just a different kind of network you're, um, you're looking at. So I'll end there and see if there are questions.